All right, what is going on, everybody? Welcome back to SaberSims DFS Office Hours. It is Wednesday, March 30th of 2022. Thanks for tuning into the stream here today. Uh, we've got a, a few things on tap for today's show. I wanted to take the opportunity to uh, demo a couple of the uh, recent releases that we've made to the app. I think uh, we had a release uh, earlier this week that has a, a couple cool features, some of which have been asked for quite a bit uh, even on episodes of this stream. So I wanted to, to showcase a few of those changes. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our MLB content calendar coming up as we kind of get through the final week before the start of baseball season. And then, of course, answer uh, a handful of other questions that have come in uh, so far, we've got, I see a couple questions about, um, again, how to kind of get more of a player that you want uh, in your lineups. And maybe I guess a little bit more from the standpoint of how the different methods of doing that act differently in the app. A um, couple other questions about baseball as well. So we'll go ahead. We'll get into things here. Um, I'm going to actually start um, with this question from Joe, um, because I think it's a good opportunity to talk about our baseball content calendar coming up. So uh, Joe said, I've had pretty good success with NBA this year due to Saberson's help and guidance. Much thanks. Uh, never played baseball DFS. I'm wondering what similarities and differences in strategy uh, you feel are integral to know slash learn correlation, ownership, game theory, uh, basically how and or what should a beginner keep in mind when building MLB lineups. I'm sure there's already a video out there. Again, thank you for everything. Yeah. So Joe, I've got good news. So tomorrow during this time block, this normal stream, uh, I'm going to have Matt come on uh, and we'll be talking a little bit about overall higher level baseball DFS strategy, the, the core fundamentals of what it takes uh, to be successful in baseball DFS and talking specifically to Matt about his process. Um, one of the more esteemed baseball DFS players uh, in our community here. So really looking forward to that. That will be live. Live, and we will be answering questions that you guys have live on stream. So uh, if you have questions um, about baseball DFS specific questions, you can pop them into the Office Hours channel in Slack or just ask them live when we're on stream. Uh, if you're just getting started and uh, maybe it's your first season, like you mentioned here, don't even maybe know where to start with the, the specific questions, just come and join us and come listen uh, to that conversation. I think that will help a bunch in getting you up to speed. We'll be following that up with another stream on Friday with Matt again, but also Will talking more specifically about Sabersim's baseball model and our simulations, uh, how it's built, what it takes into account, uh, what the benefits of using Sims are for baseball DFS, and then also a little bit more um, strategy of kind of using Sabersim to build winning lineups. Uh, those will both be two live streams again happening this week. I will follow all of that up next week as we get to the final few days before opening day with a couple two probably two shorter recorded videos, probably hoping for like that 10 minute range. That'll be kind of our official strategy guide, uh, our official tutorial of how to use Saberson to build winning baseball lineups. So we're hoping uh, to create kind of a nice little curriculum here uh, of some baseball content as we uh, approach opening day. So um, baseball DFS is a blast. I think uh, it, it's it's always tough to say this. I always feel like the next main sport that is about to start uh, always feels like my favorite, but I really do think that baseball DFS is my is my favorite DFS sport, um, especially using Saber Sim, high variance sport, high correlation. Uh, don't want to spill all the beans from tomorrow's stream, but uh, it, it, it's a lot of fun. So uh, definitely recommend everybody watching really, but especially Joe here who asked this question. Tune in tomorrow. Um, obviously, we'll be up as a recording on YouTube after the fact if you missed the live show, so no worries there. Uh, but a lot, of, a lot of baseball content over the next few days. So really looking forward to that. But um, And then let's go ahead Ahead and we'll get the app pulled up here. Uh, and I wanted to take an opportunity here to just show off a couple recent changes to the app uh, that went live in our most recent release. So uh, I had talked about this on Monday. This was actually live as of Monday, um, but I only learned that it was live here uh, from Will joining the stream and letting me know uh, in the YouTube chat. But we do now have, uh, I would say, kind of full support for the Counter-Strike uh, side of the app. So uh, we had our average projections in there for a long time. We've had Counter-Strike support using Will's model up for a long time, uh, but we now have what I would describe as full support here. So you'll see um, detailed stat projections, percentiles, uh, you'll get 
distributions when clicking on a player and when building your lineups, the sim variant slider will be working exactly as it does for other sports where we'll be pulling directly from our game simulations for Counter-Strike. So uh, very exciting there. I know it's been a while since we've had Will on talking a little Counter-Strike strategy. So maybe when we find a good opportunity here, um, once baseball gets started, uh, we'll have Will back on and maybe we can do a, a little bit of a Counter-Strike stream here since uh, we've got the um, best Counter-Strike DFS player in the world uh, on the team here. It would be awesome to have him on uh, and pick his brain a little bit. So uh, anyway, that is one of the changes. Definitely exciting there. Let's bounce back to NBA. Um, and we have two other changes here. I'll do kind of the easier one first or the more simple one. Both of these next changes, uh, very common requests that I've gotten on stream here before. So uh, the first is in the entry editor. Very subtle change, but uh, as somebody that uses the ranking tool quite a bit, I think it's a nice one. You can now use both the column sorts and the drag and drop together. Uh, so for a while, it was one or the other. I think Andrew was actually asking about this on stream uh, maybe a week ago. And now it works as you would expect. So if you wanted to do something like, let's say you're using the unique rank fill method, you want a unique lineup into every entry, but you want those to go into a very specific order. You want your best lineup in maybe your most expensive contest and so on down the list. Uh, you can now, for example, sort by buy-in, which is a nice way to kind of initially do the sort, uh, but then maybe you're opinionated above and beyond that. You know, for example, uh, and one has quite a bit bigger of a prize pool than either the elbow shot or the daily dollar. Um, they... Technically, the elbow shot obviously has a bigger buy-in. Uh, maybe we want, you know, to use that sort, but drag the and one up a little bit more, um, or maybe just below the four-point play or something like that. So I think it makes, uh, for those of you out there using the unique rank fill method, uh, which is definitely something that I do on certain sports, certain contest types, things like that, uh, makes it way easier um, to uh, do that. There's also a, a number of bug fixes that went live along with this. Uh, there was a little bit of just just strange behavior that would come up here um, every once in a while that is all kind of fixed. So this, this sorting and ranking uh tool should really work a lot more smoother now and do kind of what you expect it to do. So uh, that's a nice one there. And then I think probably maybe the most practical or the most functional change um, that was made for those of you that uh, like to do some research in the percentiles, like to do some research in the uh, detailed stat projections, anything like that, uh, those are now available to you either setting groups in the rules tab here or in step three. So we'll look at the groups first, uh, but you can now come in here and there's an edit columns button here. Um, and you can actually kind of choose, you know, maybe you want to build a group um, based on percentiles or based on minutes projections or some other detailed stat projection. You can add this to your column here um, and say, you know, I'm just kind of thinking out loud, a hypothetical, maybe you want um, no player, no two players that are projected for less than, then 20 minutes or something like that. So you could grab everybody here, right? Um, let's see, we'll grab, I guess this does include some of these players that are out, but I think you get the idea, right? So very cool there. Um, but I think maybe even the more useful part, obviously um, not always using groups for every single slate here, or maybe not even that often, at least for me. Um, one of the more useful things, I think one of the cooler things now is you can also add these columns in step three to your exposures table. Uh, so, um, there's a ton of different ways that you can use this. I, I have had questions from a lot of people on this stream uh, asking to do a variety of different things. You can get pretty creative with the way that you're using this. So if you want to, you know, if you're using percentiles for research, right? I think this is probably the best use case that I, I'm thinking of here. Uh, I know a lot of you guys out there will use percentiles for research. Just want to see what 95th percentiles look like for different players. It was really tedious before to go change this to 95th. Uh, look at what you needed to look at and then come back. You can now just add that here as a column um, and say, I also want to see 95th percentiles. Um, and we'll add a column there. Obviously, this is sortable, drag and drop. Um, you could put this right next to here and see, you know, um, for example, you know, how do the 95th percentiles compare to the average projections for some of these players? I'm getting a lot of exposure to. Um, whatever you really want to do. Maybe you want minutes projections here. Maybe you want... Uh, I don't know. I think I think for basketball, those are the two that immediately jump to my mind is either taking advantage of a percentile um, or a um, 
minutes projection, I think probably the two that that jump out uh, at first glance to me, but uh, a lot of different uses for that. And that has been a pretty popular request. Uh, so I was pretty excited to see that go live in the app. Um, and let me know how you guys are using that. I think that's a pretty cool new feature. Uh, a lot of different ways to, to do that, especially, you know, just to aid your research, uh, make it a little bit easier to get your lineup styled in the way that you want. So very excited about that. Uh, three new features going live this week, full Counter-Strike support, um, the ability to use the uh, drag and drop and sorting columns in the entry editor, and also uh, taking any bit of data that's present in step one and adding it to the tables that you see for your groups in step two, and also for your exposure table in step three. So very exciting stuff. But cool. I see uh, we've got a few other people that are joining the stream now here. HC's here. Uh, Brad, kick to the head. Ryan's here. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for tuning in here today. Uh, I think a good opportunity to go ahead and start answering some questions questions here. Uh, I wanted to actually quickly start and correct uh, maybe some bad information that I gave uh, yesterday in the stream, or maybe just kind of some mixed information here. Um, Epic Problems that I was catching up on yesterday's stream wanted to comment on the question about using the button to fill versus using the drop down menus as it seemed to cast a doubt on what the individual table dropdowns were capable of doing. So there was a question here yesterday uh, about um, using the fill button. Well, I'll give the entry editor a second to load. Using the fill button here uh, versus selecting your lineups and your fill method in the dropdown. Um, and I, I did, I apologize for this. I think I did cast a little bit of doubt over using the dropdowns. Um, which wasn't my intention. And I have gone back and talked to Matt and the rest of the team here about this. Uh, there is no material difference between using the fill button and using the drop downs menu when you're selecting what lineups go into what contest. So in other words, um, if you went here and said 20, right? And then go in and click rank or, or whatever, really anything you wanted to do. However, you're using these versus using this button to fill, uh, no real difference. I think the main thing really is that it's a bit easier to fill multiple contests at once using the uh, fill button. So I think that's a, I mean, I would say that's a little bit preferred for me, but uh, yesterday I definitely gave the impression that that had a different functionality. And that is the main thing I want to correct. There is no real difference between doing either of those things in either way. So I apologize for the confusion there. I especially apologize if I uh, freaked anybody out um, that felt like maybe they were doing it the wrong way because that was not the case. So I uh, wanted to correct that um, and um, touch on that. So um, cool. Let's keep it going here and let's get into another question. This is from uh, Tone here. And uh, this is a baseball question, um, particularly about research builds. So um, let's see what this says here. So he says, uh, when conducting research builds to determine optimal percentage, do you recommend leaving the correlation slider on? Previously, you mentioned doing so in other sports affects the purity of the data. I gave it some thought. Since baseball is one of the most correlated sports in terms of hitters in a lineup, does it make sense to look at optimal percentage in terms of the stacks because of the correlations? Uh, should we use the correlation slider plus a stack rule? Yeah, so uh, we've gone back and forth on this. I've talked about this a bunch here. Um, Ultimately, I, I, I think the best way of thinking about this is just asking yourself, what are you trying to accomplish in your research build? Are you trying to research stacks or are you trying to research individual players? And it really just depends on what your goal is there. Uh, if your goal is to research stacks, I would leave, I think either having the correlation slider on at its default value or just setting a stack rule is fine. Uh, I, I think I've gone back and forth and I, I maybe said that one is better than the other. I think in reality, uh, from a practical standpoint, there's no real difference between doing those two things. Um, if you want to research individual players, so if you're trying to find uh, what players may be over-owned relative to their chance of showing up in the optimal lineup, uh, then turn those ten, then turn the correlation slider off uh, and, and, and remove any stacking rules, right? Because ultimately what's going to happen is if you're researching players and, uh, you know, maybe Dodgers stacks overall are he heavily owned and have a very high chance of showing up in the winning lineup, you may inflate, um, oh, wow, we have spring training projections on. I didn't know that. Um, you may inflate the percent chance of a player being in the winning lineup because of a, a stack rule that you set. Um, so it, it really, the, the answer to this question is ask yourself, what are you trying to research? Are you trying to research stacks or are you trying to research individual players? Um, and then if you want stack information, right, leave the correlation slider up or set a stacking rule, I think is the simplest, the simplest option. I think I would still slightly prefer, you know, if you wanted to see what are the best five stacks that I can play or what are the most likely five stacks to be optimal, 
Um, I would probably still instead use a stacking rule. Um, that would probably be my preferred way of going about doing this and then building your build like this. Um, but that is kind of somewhat immaterial. I, I, I don't think that um, is going to make a huge difference in the actual results you get here. And for those of you that are maybe kind of just watching or unfamiliar with these research builds, I always, every time we talk about research builds on this stream, uh, I want to be very careful that uh, a research build is exactly as it sounds, right? Uh, this is kind of a clever tool that I use where I turn correlation off. Typically I turn ownership fade off and I turn sim variance all the way to 10 and I set the number of lineups to 1500. And what this basically does, Sim Variance 10 will use a single game simulation to build every single lineup in your pool. So you are essentially getting to see the optimal lineup from 1500 different slate simulations. It's a very useful tool to basically determine how likely a certain player is to show up in the winning lineup or the optimal lineup compared to their ownership projection. This is by no means, I want to be as clear as possible, this is by no means ever the way I would generally recommend building your actual lineups, right? If you're building actual lineups for your baseball contests, use the default sliders, right? Those are going to give you lineups that are actually, you know, ready to be played into your contest. But for research, uh, I like to, to play around with these research builds with these 0010 settings, um, at least uh, on occasion here, depending on the sport um, and do that. But uh, I know there's, there's often questions that come in on this stream that are about research builds from people that have watched a lot of these other streams. Um, been a part of this research build conversation as it's been kind of ongoing in the past year of doing this stream or so. Um, and I, I always want to be very clear to those of you that are new to office hours uh, or, or somewhat new to the concept of a research build that this is exactly as it sounds. It is for research. It allows you to turn, it allows you to basically compare the percent chance of a player being in the optimal lineup to their ownership projection to determine a stand you want to take. Um, if you were doing it from stacks, for example, you could compare um, potentially one way we've talked about doing this is compare the percent of the time that a team shows up as a five stack compared to uh, how Vegas maybe projects each team, right? That's a, another clever way of kind of doing it uh, and, and getting a little bit of an ownership edge there. But we'll talk a little bit more about what this all looks like in practice uh, as we kind of move into the start of baseball season. But um, Tone, again, kind of to, to bring us back to the question here, uh, if you are researching stacks, I don't think there is a significant difference between creating stacks in your research build by turning the correlation slider up or setting a stacking rule. I would probably slightly lean towards setting the stacking rule then because then you just know that that stack's going to be in every lineup, right? You'll know if you're interested in seeing what are the best five stacks to play. If you set the stacking rule, then you know that they're all they're all there. You always get a five stack in your in your lineup. Uh, if you use the correlation slider instead, you're a little bit more at the whims of um, you know there actually being the right stack size in that lineup. So cool. Okay, let's keep it going here. Uh, another question from Joe. And uh, this one says, a question about step one. When you feel a player is going to overperform and want a large portion or sometimes even 100% of this player in your lineups, will the optimizer react differently when creating lineups when you lock a player in versus increasing their projection versus increasing the minimum ownership? Uh, good question. And uh, yes, it, I mean, it, it does. Um, you may end up at the same result at the end of all of that, uh, but you there's, there is a little bit of a different pathway to getting there in terms of the way the optimizer builds the lineup. So, you know, if we took somebody like you Jokic and just click the lock button, what that's going to do is that's going to basically say for every single lineup built by the builder, Jokic is just going to be the first player in. He's going to go in. It does not matter what sims were pulled. Uh, we'll still pull simulations for each lineup. Each lineup will be based on a set of simulations, but no matter what Jokic's projection is in that lineup um, or that set of sims or any other things going on there, he just goes in, right? Um Setting a minimum exposure, I think this question, instead of saying increasing min ownership, I think uh, Joe meant exposure here. Setting a minimum exposure is kind of like a lighter version of that. If you set a minimum exposure uh, of 50% to Jokic, for example, we will basically say for any given lineup, when comparing to the other lineups in the pool, is, is that minimum exposure set? <clears throat> so for the first lineup created, uh, Jokic's exposure in the pool is zero, right? There are no lineups. So the first lineup is guaranteed to have Jokic in it right? 
when the second lineup is made, the only other lineup in the pool has Jokic in it. So your exposure, your rolling exposure at that point is 100%. So that lineup, that next lineup does not necessarily need to have Jokic in it. It might end up having Jokic in it, but it doesn't need to have Jokic in it. Uh, and then, so that lineup gets created. Let's say it doesn't have Jokic in it. Now you have two lineups in the pool. One has Jokic, one doesn't. The minimum exposure of 50% is met. The third lineup does not necessarily need to have Jokic. Let's say it doesn't. Then when you get to the fourth lineup, Jokic's exposure in your pool is 33%, one out of three. To meet the minimum exposure, we have to put Jokic in that lineup. So we do. So it's kind of a rolling uh, average minimum or maximum exposures uh, of each player in the pool um, that we kind of meet as we build lineups. Now, this is very simple when you're describing one single player. If you have minimum and maximum exposures for every single player in the pool, uh, it does get a little bit more complicated. We have um, kind of our own... I don't even know. I, it, it, we have a system for dealing with a situation where every single player in the pool has a minimum exposure, for example, um, or a min and a max, because obviously with only eight players in a lineup, you can't meet a minimum exposure to even 10 different players all at once, right? So we have ways of kind of dealing with that, but that is a simple version of how that works. Um, updating a player's projection <clears throat> has probably the most unique result here. Um, if we updated Jokic's projection to, uh, let's say, 70.08, just as a hypothetical, right? We wanted to increase our exposure to Jokic. What that's going to do is that's actually going to affect the data coming out of the simulations themselves. So what happens here, this is a seven-point increase at Jokic's average projection. We will take all of our simulations of the Denver game and across Jokic's entire range of outcomes, we will increase his output by that same difference. So his fantasy point output in any one individual simulation we have for this game will be increased by seven points. When he scores 40, now he scores 47. When he scores 90, now he scores 97. But when we go to actually build your lineups, we select from the same simulations that we have for all the games on the slate. Uh, we will just adjust Jokic's projection as the set of Denver and Indiana Sims are chosen for each individual lineup. So uh, locking a player or setting a minimum or a maximum exposure is definitely more of a uh, a rule. It is a, a, a bit of a restriction put on the builder. It, it changes, it basically places requirements on the builder to use certain players in some lineups versus others. Um Adjusting a projection changes the, the simulations themselves. It doesn't place a restriction on the builder. It doesn't necessarily say you have to use this player in all of your lineups. It just changes the, the data that's being fed to the builder. Um, obviously, changing Jokic's pro mean projection to something like 100 would, in effect, lock him into your lineups. I think you'd almost certainly get 100% exposure to Jokic if this were the case. But it is, in theory, a different path to getting there than just locking him in. Um I would say if you were asking what to do um, or what's best, there isn't one of these that is a better approach than the others. I would just ask yourself what your goals are. Um, obviously, if you want 100% exposure to a player, the simplest and fastest way to do that is to just lock them into your lineups. Uh, if you have an under, if you have an idea of what exposure, minimum exposure you exactly want, if you know you want at least 50% exposure to Jokic, uh, set that right. Um, and let us know. It's a little bit harder to look at a projection and say, how, what do I bump this projection to to make sure I get 50%? If you know you want 50%, uh, give it a little bump. If you in general know that maybe you want to be a little bit higher or lower on a player, um, or maybe think there's something that the projections are not capturing, um, if the projections just intuitively look or feel a little bit higher low, that's when I would make adjustments to projections. Um, and I like to use 10% bumps. I think 10% bumps up or down is just a really clean way of uh, allowing the Sims to still have their value, but still leave an impact for yourself. So maybe you felt like this projection seemed a little high, right? So you could take this projection down. 10% um, would be, you know, to roughly 57, um, something like that. And I think that would be a good way of, of being a little bit more bearish on Jokic while still taking advantage of the Sims. So hopefully that was... Uh, helpful walkthrough of those three different um, three different methods there. Um, I'm going to jump backwards. I just realized I missed a question that had come in from Profit yesterday evening. Uh, we'll answer this one real quickly. Um, and then we'll, this is the last question I see in Slack. So after that, we'll jump over to YouTube chat. Um, a little light on the questions, all things considered here today. So if you guys have questions for me, uh, fire away now. 
Um, and uh, we'll, we'll probably be getting to your questions here pretty quickly. But this one from Profit, uh, I want to play six different single entry lineup contests. Do I input 20 lines to be simulated or six? Yeah, so um, what you would want to do here, you come in here, you're playing six single entry contests. So specify the contest, give us the entrance. Um, so we have the slider set at the right point here. Uh, ultimately, what's actually in this field here doesn't really matter and it can be changed later. So I think the most logical thing to do here would be to say, I want six lineups. So give me six lineups and then click start new build. Um, but in the event that you accidentally put the wrong number in that number of lineups box, you can, you can always change that after the build. So I'll show you how to do that, which can also be useful here sometimes, depending on what you're trying to do. So that number that's in the number of lineups box in the build settings ultimately only controls this number here, which is how many lineups you're looking at from your pool. The pool is how many total lineups we made. Uh, this number is basically how many lineups you want from the pool. Uh, so if you had done this and put in six on accident and you actually needed 20, you can come back and update this and we'll pull 20 lineups from the pool instead. Um, if you had done 20 on accident and you actually only need one, you can come over here and change that to one um, and then we'll just give you one lineup. Obviously need to make two changes to uh, get rid of the DraftKings message and actually see what that lineup is. But um, the yeah, the number of lineups is, is in theory how many lineups you actually want to play from the build that you're building. Uh, but you can, if you mess it up or change your mind later, you can change the number on step three here and see more or less lineups. So, cool. Let me make sure I got to all these questions here. Um, let's see. Okay. One other question. This just came in from Lou and Slack, and then we'll jump over to, um, the YouTube chat. I see, again, I see some questions coming in YouTube chat, so I'll be over there in a second here. Um, Lou said, once you move the sliders to your liking, does it void all other preset settings? Does it no longer matter if you have it set to 20 max, 50 max, et cetera? Yeah. So the drop downs here are only are really only there to get these sliders to where they should be, right? They're really only they're they're really only there to help. Um, so, for example, if you come in here and you know these are your default twenty maxes, but you decide to turn your sim variance up to nine, it doesn't matter at this point what the drop downs say. Uh, or if you had you know the sliders are at five. Another way of looking at this: these sliders are at five, three, nine, and they're set to twenty max, ten to fifty k. If we went to one fifty max and said this, but still set the sliders at 539, you would get the same build, basically. You wouldn't get the identical lineups because the sim variant slider is going to change your, your lineups no matter what. But the only thing that ultimately matters as it is fed to the builder is what the actual values of the sliders are. The dropdowns are only there to help you get to the right ones more easily. So um, it does not matter. There is no difference between difference 412 at this setting versus 412 at this setting so good question and let me know if that that's clear i know that one is a little kind of the question can be a little tricky to uh answer clearly sometimes here so um okay cool let's jump up uh scrolling back up to the top of the stream here uh brad had said i'm not usually not utilizing late swap correctly as i keep getting it for one line except for the multiple i have in what am i doing wrong um probably the easiest thing to do here is to uh just re-download your entries file so well i guess a couple things first of all so if you go into late swap right this grayed out box here that shows up here is going to be the number of unique. Actually, let me start over with a fresh entries file. Oops. So that we can kind of be as clear as possible. Okay. So this number that shows up when you click late swap, right? It's, it's going to be grayed out. What it is, is it is the number of total unique lineups that we can see in your entries file, right? So for example, right now, all I have is just reserved entries. I have basically one blank lineup that's in all of my entries. So it's when it comes up here, it's saying, oh, you want to late swap the one dummy lineup that you essentially have in. If I were to come over here and fill this, right? 
with a 20 max build, for example, and I can fill and uh, maybe say, um, you know, we'll just use the rank fill, right? Then once I go to download, this is kind of an important step. You need to download your entries file. Then we'll perceive that there are 20 unique lineups, right? I used a rank fill of 20 different lineups. So now we'll take each unique lineup, each 20, and late swap it when we go to late swap. If you are in a situation where it's the middle of the slate, and you're trying to late swap, and this number of unique lineups is not matching up to the actual number of unique lineups that you have on DraftKings or FanDuel, it's probably because somewhere along the way that your entries file got out of sync with what's actually on the site. Um, this can happen for a number of different reasons. Uh, maybe if you don't use the entry file to actually upload your original entries file, or you go to the site later and make some changes yourself, there's a variety of different things that can happen. But if you're in a pinch and you need to get this number to say the right actual thing, um, the easiest thing to do is just download and upload a new entries file. So you can do that by clicking upload new entries, click download template file from DraftKings, which will download the new entries file, the whatever the most recent updated one is, and then select it and re-upload. And that should resolve that problem. Um, if you've done that and you're still having problems, uh, use the settings link in the upper right and then click report a problem and give us a brief description of what's going on. That'll send information over to our support and development team about your session. We can look a little bit closer. Uh, we have had a couple, well, I would say we did have a couple reports of basically not tracking the entries file for a user correctly. And you could do everything right and still have that issue where it was just saying one lineup. Um, we've believed to have fixed all of that, but if it's still happening, we would want to know about that. So um, if you're kind of following the typical entry editor steps correctly, but still running into issues there, um, you can use that report a problem link. But the, the easiest thing to do when you're in a pinch to get your late swaps in is to just start with a fresh entries file. And that'll, that'll always fix it. So um, cool. Question from Guadalupe. Once you move the slide, oh, same question had come in through, through Slack here. So we, we've already covered this one here. Uh, we'll jump to the other one here. This is from Tampa Bay. Uh, he says, how does one perform late swaps on SaberSim to apply towards my entered in play lineups? Good question. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit here. So um, we make it very easy here uh, or as easy as possible. So um, once you have your entries in play, right? Uh, so, you know, maybe we're playing 20 lineups in the slate here tonight. Um and we've, we've got our, our entry editor pulled up here. All you need to do is click the swap button. There are two different swap tools on SaberSim. So we have quick swap and late swap. Uh, the quick swap option is basically just a very easy way to get any player, a specific player or any player that's out, out of all of your lineups. So you could come in here. Uh, let's say we got like surprise news that um, Trey Mann got ruled out or something like that. And we have 18% exposure to him. We got to get him out relatively quickly. We could come over here click quick swap uh, and just basically click apply and download. And it'll very quickly remove all of Trey man from all of your lineups and replace them with the next best projected player that uses the salary available and fits into that position. Um, basically avoids a situation where you only have a, a little bit of time to get it done and you avoid a zero in your lineup. Um, but the more robust swap tool is the late swap tool. And what the late swap tool will do is when you come in here, you can go in and pick your, your settings, the same settings that you would have used before lock, uh, prior to lock. Um, and what we'll do is we take every single lineup as it is. We lock the players in who are in that lineup whose games have already started. We exclude all the players that are not in that lineup whose games have already started. And then we rebuild the best possible lineup around it using the most recent up-to-date simulations and projections on our end uh, while keeping track of all of the important things that are still important to GPP success, correlation, ownership, uh, and variance. So uh, it's it's a pretty powerful tool that allows you to update uh, very quickly. Um, and it basically, once you come over here and click late swap, We'll go ahead. Obviously, this is the middle of the day. The slate hasn't started. So essentially what's actually happening here is we're just rebuilding all 20 lineups. Um, but we will take you over to the late swap build. Um, you can see what lineups changed. In this case, all 20 are going to change. But as the slate goes on, sometimes in later later swaps, later in the night, some lineups won't change anymore. Um, and then this download new entries button is a 
we'll download a new entries file. You don't need to go, one, one common thing I see people mess up um, is you don't need to go back to the entry editor and fill this in anymore. You can just download your new entries file from here and that file is ready to be uploaded to DraftKings or FanDuel or whatever. So, um, Dante says, hey, Jordan, when late swapping, I've been adjusting the sliders uh, to 0, 0, 010 or 0, 0110, and I love what it gives me. Is that viable, or should I run late swap with the original slider things for that contest? Um, it's, it's not non-viable. Um, I don't know if it's necessary, necessarily optimal. Um, what you, you, you're basically, you're going to be probably playing a pretty high variance style. Uh, you'll probably get very spread out exposures doing that, uh, because you're using a single game simulation to late swap every single lineup once, right? So you'll take a lineup, you'll use a random sim of the remaining games on the slate and build the best possible lineup around that. That's what happens at zero, zero, 10, uh, zero, one, 10. We'll do that with just a little bit of additional ownership fade in there. Um, I don't know necessarily if it's to your benefit to turn the correlation slider off uh in basketball correlations between players are low right you'll see the maximum most correlations are negative and they're generally not very big most of the correlations in basketball are between players playing on the same team that occupy a somewhat similar role on the team um they're not huge factors because the raw correlation numbers are low, but especially on a big slate like tonight, I think it's useful to keep track of correlation. Um, you are kind of capturing correlation in a more roundabout way because correlation is essentially, correlation is kind of already captured when you're using a single game simulation, right? If you use a, if you late swap a lineup and you late swap into extra Nikola Jokic, right? Um, and you get more more Jokic. I know he's playing in the first game of the slate tonight, but just as an example, right? Since you're using a single game sim in that late swap, you're probably not also getting Aaron Gordon alongside it, just because those players probably have a little bit of a light negative correlation to one another. And uh, it's, it's unlikely that Jokic has his absolute ceiling outcome while Gordon does also. That's, an, that's a kind of an unlikely situation. So um, I don't know. Uh, Dante, I guess all, all of this to say, I, I don't, I will say it like this. I don't know if that's adding value. Um, I think it's probably not hurting you. Uh, I'm not sure it's adding value. Ultimately, if, if you like it, I, I, I don't see any issue with that. Um, the best practice, overall best practices, I would say you're probably better off leaving your slider settings alone as you're late swapping throughout the night. I think this may be potentially introducing a little bit too much variance into your swaps. Uh, by pumping it all the way up to like 0, 0, 010, I would probably say best practice is to um, to use the default sliders. But with that said, if you're doing this and you like the lineups you're getting out of it, I I, I don't think it's going to be hurting you. Um, I don't think it's necessarily um, making your lineups significantly worse. So, um, HC said, Jordan, do you prefer using Saber score to determine which lineup or lineups you would choose also by, uh, sorting by say salary or ownership Would those better be suited for cash over GPP? Um, good questions here. Let's jump back to a build here. So in terms of deciding which lineups that I want to play, I essentially always just look at the Saber score. So if we had a build that was for 20 lineups, for example, um, I, I don't, I don't ever change this sort really to use it for something else in terms of determining what lineups I want to play. Now that does not mean Saber score is the end all be all for me in step three. The way I like to decide the way that I like to describe Saber score is treating it as a tiebreaker. Once you've added all the other value that you want to add uh, to your, your process. For example, if you said that 80% exposure to Trey Lyles was too much risk for you on tonight's slate, I wouldn't tell you that no, listen to Saber score, you should take 80% exposure to him. If it's too much exposure, make an adjustment to his exposure here, reducing his exposure to maybe 40%, right? But then allow Saber score to help decide what are the final 20 lineups that you end up taking with you into your contest, right? So I think Saber score does a very good job of, of being that final tiebreaker of saying which 20 of this pool of 500 should I take with me into my contest? But it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean you 
you should only take the top 20 ever and add no additional value in step three. Uh, you should absolutely adjust your projections or exposure uh, to manage risk and to get your your lineups where you want them here um, when you're when you're when you're managing in step three. Uh, with that said, though, I do think that Saber score is probably the best option to making that tiebreaker decision for you here. Um, projected score, especially in a sport like NBA, is probably going to be fine. It's not going to have a big impact. Um, but in other sports that are more high variance, uh, where we need to fade ownership more more uh, heavily, where we want to correlate our lineups a little bit more, Saber score is going to do the best job of combining all of those factors and giving you the highest upside lineups possible. Right, because that's that's what Saber Score is designed to do. Uh, the the limitation of judging your lineups based on projected score is the same limitation as judging individual players based on average projections. Right, average projections alone are not predictive of upside. A, a average projected score for a lineup cannot cannot tell us how much ownership does that uh, lineup fade, how correlated it is. Is it what is the raw scoring upside of this lineup when all these players have their ceiling outcomes? That's what Saber Score does. So uh, these other sorts here, the ownership and salary sorts, these are mostly, I think, best used for research. If you are interested, for example, to see what the highest ownership builds are or the lowest ownership builds in your pool are, I think it can be interested to look at those for research. Um, I probably wouldn't use those on their own to decide what lineups to play. Um, for ownership, for example, you know, maybe you wanted to say, I'm going to play the lowest owned lineups possible in my pool um, to get as much leverage as possible. Saber score is already going to capture ownership on its own, but then also compare that to the other factors of correlation and sim variance. It's basically going to deal with the ownership problem in a more uh, kind of leveled, natural way that takes into account these other factors of upside as well. Um, if you are playing cash games, I would probably say at that point for cash, you should probably use the projected score um, settings. Um, so obviously for cash games, you would want to go in and use the 000 sliders, right? The defaults for cash. Um, and when you go to build this, you will see that there is probably no difference between Saber score and projected score for cash games. The highest projected average lineup and the highest saver score lineup are almost always the exact same. And if they are any different, it's probably a fraction of a percentage point. Um, we'll go ahead and we'll just stop there at 15. Um, let's see if it changes at all. Okay, so in this case, no difference between saver score and projected score for the cash lineup, which is what we would expect. I think there's maybe an interesting argument to be made about using the highest um, owned lineup. Um, but I wouldn't be willing to sacrifice too much projected points to do that. Like, for example, you know, let's compare here. So we have lineup one. Actually, let's just look at our entire pool because it'll be easier. Lineup one is projected for 289.9, right? Um, the highest projected owned lineup has two additional cumulative ownership project ownership, right? But sacrifices uh, two and a half fantasy points of projection. I would probably never be willing to make that sacrifice. I would say in general, your best bet for cash games is to just play the highest projected owned lineup. If you could get a lineup that was projected for just a slight bit less, like I'm talking less than a point and get significantly higher ownership on it, I think you could make an argument that from a game theory standpoint, it makes more sense to play the higher owned lineup, but that is probably the only situation I would do that. And that is a big exception, not the rule. So I'm talking about like, if this lineup was 289.9 and this lineup was 289.8 and this was 112, but this was 180, I would probably want to play this lineup a little bit more because you'd be a little bit safer there from a cash game standpoint. Um, but General general rule of thumb for cash games is is just use either the either the highest projected saver score or the highest projected projected score is fine um, because they're almost always going to be the exact same. Um, they're going to be almost the exact same lineup all the time. So um, Tracy said, "Is it better to bring the team projected score to whole numbers or to try and adjust individual players?" Um, I would just, for that situation, I would ask yourself, you know, what is, what are you trying to accomplish? 
right? Uh, if you are bullish on the entire team, right? If you think the scoring environment for an entire team is going to be better than it's projected based on the team totals, then adjust that, right? Maybe you think, um, or maybe you even just are thinking about game outcomes. Maybe you think that the Heat give Boston a closer game than our spread is implying. And maybe you think that they score a little bit more as a team. And you want to just set this to 110, basically assume that that game is a pick em. Um, the nice thing about doing that is it's going to make an adjustment to all Miami Heat players. It'll also make an adjustment to all the Celtics players, or many of them, uh, based on what the individual Sims look like in our system when the game is 110 to 110 as a mean outcome. Right? We see here, it looks like for most of the Miami players, they all get a boost. Uh, Boston players, kind of a mixed bag. Some of them get a boost. Some of them get knocked down a peg. So if that was where you were coming at this from, right, that would be a great way to do it. If you instead, let's flip this back here. Maybe you were looking at projections um, and felt like we were, let's take a look. Let's adjust these back down. Maybe you felt like uh, we were a little bit low on Jimmy Butler's projection overall, right? Uh, it wasn't so much of a situation where you thought we were under projecting the heat, uh, but, or maybe in your research, you just determined that this was a good leverage play that you thought a lot of people weren't going to be on Butler and you wanted to get a little bit more exposure to him. In that case, you can make an adjustment. We'll do the 10% adjustment ish here again and bump only Butler, right? That impact is, is going to only affect Butler. So I would say, ultimately ask yourself, what are, what are your goals here? What are you trying to accomplish? Uh, are you, do you have a stance or a take about a team or a game environment at, at large? If that's the case, I would make the adjustment at the team level so that you get the opportunity to adjust everybody that's playing in that game. Um, if you are instead looking at a particular player or you think maybe one player or the other is, is over or under projected, then make the adjustment at the per player level. So one, one is probably not better than the other for all situations. It, it really depends a lot on what you're trying to accomplish. But good question. And then Clay said, is, uh, is there a way that Saberson can add primary and secondary stacks so we can put your exposures for MLB? Um, let's jump over to baseball here. So what I would probably do here uh, is maybe set a stacking rule that captures, I would say, I would say what I would probably do is, is set a stacking rule that captures what the kind of lineup constructions that you want are. So let's say, for example, you're building for spring training training slate just for fun, and you've decided that you want a 5-3 stack in every lineup. You can come in here, at least five from the same team, at least three from the same team. There isn't a way to set exposures in the stacking rules, at least not the way this is currently set up. But what you can do then is build here, build yourself a nice big pool, and adjust the exposures to your individual stacks in step three. Um, in baseball, you're generally probably going to have a pretty high sim variance. You're probably going to have a lot of diversity to your lineups, um, and you can make adjustments here in step three. If you can't get the exact exposures you want, and I don't even know if this is actually going to work. I don't know if we have full. Okay, so we don't have full support here. Let's go back to a an old slate. Um, I should have known that. I don't think those projections are supposed to be up there, to be completely honest. So let's go back to a slate from last year and do the same thing. So we'll set our stacks here. We'll do three players from the same team and a five stack. So we're getting only five threes. And we'll build. We'll give this a moment to build here. get a moment for me to catch my breath here. I th think this is the last question in my queue as well. So uh, if anybody else has any other questions for me, go ahead and fire away. Uh, probably hang out here for another 10 or 15 minutes on today's stream. I'm going to let this build a big pool of 500 because we're uh, we're making adjustments to exposures here. So we'll just give this a moment to, to finish up. And, and, and while it's building too, I think I, I will say, um, you know, there, there are a couple other options here. Uh, if, 
you know before the build that you want a certain exposure to a particular team stack. I mean, one very easy way to do that is to set a minimum exposure to some of those players in step one. You know, if you want 15% Dodger stacks, go in and pick some of the main primary Dodgers bats uh, and set a minimum exposure of 15% in step one. And that'll, that'll help you along there. You could also make adjustments, you know, uh, similar to what we do with players on step one for NBA. If you know that you are higher or lower on certain stacks from the beginning, you can make those adjustments to the team totals in step one, and we'll be able to get you the stack types you want in, um, in step three. Um, give this a second to just load up here. I have noticed, uh, for the past couple of weeks here, it's it's been a little bit slow here when looking at these old slates for baseball. Um, so, okay, here we go. So now what we can do is go into our teams and look at our five stacks, right? So, you know, maybe that's way too much exposure to the Phillies. Bring that down 30%. So that I think is the simplest way to do that. That'll also uh, allow you to build some lineups without um, necessarily, well, it'll allow you to kind of see how the builder is handling the slate uh, without making adjustments in, in step one. So, but good question. All right. I don't see any other questions coming in here. So we'll begin to kind of start to, to wrap up here. Um, and I'll, I'll keep an eye out to see if uh, anybody furiously jotting down their question, trying to enter it into the chat here. But um, as we kind of wrap up, uh, a reminder, talking already a lot about baseball here today. Uh, tomorrow's stream, I'll be having Matt on. We'll be talking all about uh, high-level MLB DFS strategy. What does it take to be successful in baseball DFS? And then on Friday, we'll have Matt back on joined by Will. We'll be talking about our baseball Sims. What goes into it? Uh, what are, what's new this season? What have we improved for this year? Uh, what are the, the, the strengths of using simulations to beat baseball DFS? And then next week, a couple shorter videos coming out um, with just me. I'll just publish those directly to the YouTube channel, uh, kind of a summarizing some of those concepts, a, a basic strategy guide. What do you need to know? Uh, quick and dirty of, of how to beat baseball DFS, and then a tutorial, uh, how to build winning baseball DFS lineups with Saberson. So look forward to that. I don't see any other questions coming in here. So uh, enjoy tonight's 11 game. I think it's an 11 game NBA slate. Uh, late March 11 game NBA slate uh, is, a, is a, a bit of chaos. Hopefully it's a, a fun one here. Uh, and we'll be right back again tomorrow uh, for that baseball stream. So take care. Until then, see you guys later.